Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap up of my reading in the first two weeks of January 2022. I have filmed an end of December wrap up, but I just haven't edited it yet, so we're going to jump in with this. The first book that I read was Cena Grace's semi autobiographical graphic novel, Not My Bag which basically tells the story of, of a cartoonist in his 20s who takes a day job selling mid-range clothing and ends up with aspirations to sell designer clothing before reevaluating his life choices essentially. As autobiographical slice of life type comics go, I enjoyed this and looking at the reviews on Goodreads I was surprised to see a lot of really negative reviews and then I realized I hadn't really read the blurb on the back, I'm just a fan of his, his general of his comics, so I hadn't really read about it. And the description describes it as a kind of neo-gothic, and the cover does have tentacles coming out of a shopping bag. So I think a lot of people went into this assuming there was going to be some kind of supernatural element, some kind of drama. When the closest drama it gets to is maybe vaguely in a Devil Wears Prada kind of style, but really it's a slice of life book. So unfortunately, mismarketed. The art style and the storytelling are in line with all of Cena Grace's work in this style, but I enjoyed this, but don't go in expecting a neo-gothic tale because that's not what it really is. And I'm baffled as to why Image Comics would have put that on the back because that is not good marketing. I followed that up by reading another inspired by true story graphic novel, and that was Le Vent de Libertaire, which I don't think is available in English. It is a, a fictionalized retelling of the life of Nestor Makhno, the Ukrainian anarchist revolutionary from the early 20th century. It has the interweaving framing device of Makhno in Paris at the end of his life, and then we flash back to his childhood in Ukraine, to the Black Revolution of 1917 that he was part of. It's not the most thrilling retelling, but it's interesting because he's kind of a controversial figure in general, and a lot of media about him portrays him as either a villain or of some, as some savior character, and this is presenting him in a fairly human way. This was volume one of two. I will eventually read the second one. I liked the art more than the storytelling, but uh, I think if you read French graphic novels and you're interested in Ukrainian history, I think it's worth picking up. Next up, one of the things I didn't mention in my statistics video, but that I realized was that when it came to Canadian fiction, I very rarely read anything that's coming out of the Maritimes. So I thought I would fix that early in the year, and I picked up a play by a Newfoundland playwright that is set in Newfoundland, and that was Paul Powers' Crippled. This, I think, is another work that has some semi-autobiographical leanings to it, in which we follow a character who uh, the notes dictate should always be played by someone with an actual visible physical disability. And in this play we meet a character who is standing on a pier, uh, looking out at the ocean, Maybe he's contemplating the meaning of life, maybe he's contemplating suicide, and another man joins him, and is this a situation that is sexual, or is it a, going to be a psychoanalysis session? Maybe it's a bit of both, maybe it's a ghost. What the play deals with primarily is this character grieving a loss, and at the same time grieving the sense of self that having been in a certain kind of relationship allowed him to be, and then he is sort of looping back to earlier insecurities. So this is the kind of story that I have seen a lot of, often with a woman who has lost a husband and then is evaluating her life in terms of the way women in midlife are perceived versus young women. And while this is a similar story, rather than having the gender and the age bits, it instead involves gay men and, and the public perceptions of self involve disability rather than aging. As it starts to play out, it's not immediately apparent that it is this story that we've heard before, um, which I thought was really interesting because often if you switch demographic categories, it doesn't change the basic story that much. So you have to appreciate this style of story to really want to continue with it. Uh, but this, I thought it, it does make enough of a difference that I almost didn't notice that it was a story I'd heard before in another format, so I appreciated that. I mean, it does use a lot of the very theatrical language, so if you are not particularly a fan of theatrical language, um, it might not be for you. It's not one of those plays that's written with a kind of natural language, it is theatrical, so there we go. And I got to check Newfoundland <laughs> off the box. And next up I read another book that grapples with uh, disability themes, and that was Emily Ramp Black's Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg. This is primarily looking at, once the work of an artist is on display, it's going to be interpreted by in different ways by different people who are bringing different elements of their own lives to the work. 
and she's looking at it in the context of a couple of displays of Frida Kahlo's work that she had seen, one in Mexico, where among the displays were Kahlo's prosthetic and back braces, which she had painted, and then another was in the UK, which included uh, photos of the artist working, which included the ones painting from bed and whatnot, where it, there is a focus on pain. And she is discussing how, as a disabled person, but specifically as an amputee, looking at, say, the painted prosthetic in a different way than an able-bodied person or a person with a different disability might view the same thing. But on the pain front, she's also bringing in an extra layer that is not the chronic pain that uh, Frida Kahlo was dealing with, but her own pain with having lost a child. Emily Ratblack has written books on this experience as well. She had a son who had Tay-Sachs disease, and she is not uh, French Canadian Jewish or Amish, who are the people that normally test for that and are prepared for, prepared is not really the right word, but who would imagine the possibility of that. So it was a surprise that she had this child who was not going to live to see his third birthday. And so she kind of mirrors that kind of pain with physical pain and goes through the motions of how she's imagining other people are viewing different pieces of art versus how she is, while still acknowledging that both metaphorically and literally she doesn't really doesn't speak the same language as the artist. It's interesting if you're interested in the way in that kind of discussion of reactions to art. I think it's it's great, but if you are not interested in that kind of discussion, it is the kind of thing that I think people read and say, this feels masturbatory. <laughs> um, so that depends on your taste involving art discussions, I think. But I think if you do like this kind of thing, uh, yeah, I would recommend it, but be prepared for that whole grief discussion because that does hang heavily over the entire thing. Next up, I read a novel by Christina Sandu called The Union of Synchronized Swimmers. This was originally published in Finnish and then the author translated it herself. It is the interweaving stories of a group of women who were factory workers in what's implied to be one of the countries in the Soviet Union, who eventually defect to the West under the guise of having formed a synchronized swimming team. So of course they do have to form a sw synchronized swimming team. And then we catch the different women at various points in their life in different countries. And a lot of it is about language, about hiding language. There's one time where there's a woman who's in Finland and she is dating a man who is from the same ethnic background. And they speak, a couple, I mean, it is Russian at one point. And she doesn't want him to know that they have the same shared mother tongue. There's another one where one of the characters is in France and there's a, she's hitchhiking and the driver is commenting on her accent. There's another one where a character is in California and she's thinking about the way her accent is a flag of one thing, but uh, she doesn't have, say the, uh, oh, what is it? The racial coding that some Cameroonian guys who are on the same ferry with her have. The best of them, I think, was a one where, where one of the swimmers is in Italy and she's having, it's the day that her Italian has kind of turned on, which if you've ever learned a second, third, fourth language, in an immersion situation. Uh, and, and I thought that was described really well. That was my favorite part of it. There is a bit at the end where one of the women has gone back to her town and she, she is supposed to be somebody who has been in the US for 20 years. And some of the English that's used in there is very British English. And I couldn't tell if that was supposed to be an error or if that was intentional and it was supposed to be flagging that this woman was lying about what country she'd been in. So that threw me and that's at the very end of the book. So up to that point, I had been enjoying it, but then there was this bit where I went, I don't know if this is a mistake or if I'm supposed to assume that everything else has been a lie. So I don't know. Because without that line, uh, I felt differently about the book than I felt after that line, which is kind of an odd reaction to have for something that's a single sentence that might be a throwaway. But when the book is so centrally about language and playing with themes of language, I found that kind of iffy. Next up, I read a multimedia book, and this is Jordan Abel's Nishka. This is a book that includes, for example, transcripts of everything from court cases to thesis defenses. It includes photography, it includes art, it includes poetry, it includes journal entries. Some of the poetry is erasure poetry, so you have bits of an anthropology textbook that have been blacked out, you have bits of court cases. You have bits of writing where the drawing obscures the writing. 
essentially wrestling with ideas of identity and, and the kind of multi-generational fallout from residential schools because he was raised without his father, who is an artist, and what that means in terms of being in touch with his father's culture um, when he was raised on the opposite side of the country. And if your indigenous territory is out in BC and you were raised in Ontario, what does that mean? What does it mean when one of the when one of the parents is missing through the framework of when people, when other people at writing conferences just in life are going to say, tell me about your indigenous experience when there's no answer to that and things like that. So it's kind of a family memoir and it's kind of about culture and history. And as a mixed media book, it can be all of those things at once. And I thought it was quite successful at doing uh, what it was trying to do. Your fondness for that kind of mixed media product may vary, but uh, yeah, I thought it worked quite well. Next up, I read Jiro Taniguchi's Zoo in Winter. This is another semi-autobiographical graphic novel in which we follow a youngish man who wants to become a manga artist, starts out in a textile factory and is put in a situation where he basically has to find a new job because he helped his boss's daughter elope. and. Uh, ends up becoming an assistant and developing along his path as a writer and moving to the big city and having roommates and being young and drinking and having kind of a cliche relationship with a, a dying girl that he's in love with, which feels cheesy, but it is a semi-autobiographical book, so what can you do? If you're interested in the lives of artists in 1960s Japan, it's kind of interesting. But what I enjoyed about this is I really liked the art style and I liked the style the stylistic difference of the character at some points uh, sneaks into art school and draws nudes. He also spends a lot of time, as the title says, at a zoo sketching. And we see the sketches within the art of the book, and I really enjoyed the contrast of that. So I think artistically, I really enjoyed this story-wise. It's a little generic, but um, yeah, it depends if you're a fan of that kind of thing. Next up, I read Alia Malik's The Home That Was Our Country. This is subtitled A Memoir of Syria, but it feels more like a journalistic work than a memoir, although part of this is her talking about her family. So the concept here is that she's looking at the last hundred years of Syrian history and interweaving it with the last hundred years of her own family's experiences, which I think would be brilliant if it were more of a true memoir. Within this, the balance between the two things is never quite right. And the author is a, a journalist and a lot of the history parts and the family parts feel like journalistic snippets. And in this, there are a number of people she talks to, both family members and friends and people she's interviewing, whose, whose names she's changed to protect them, but she also had to change a lot of their biographical details, which means you never get a good portrait of who anyone is. So because what you're looking for in a memoir is that kind of human connection, it doesn't have that. But because it's also this choppy mixture of things, it doesn't carry the, the story of the history on its own either, so that it feels like they've been thrown together in a kind of sloppy mosaic style rather than something that flows, which is a shame because there's a great amount of information in here. And I think if this had been balanced properly, it would have been just brilliant because there are so many memoirs that don't have enough historical context to them so that readers who aren't familiar with the history don't have a way to really ground it in history. And on the flip side, there are a lot of histories that don't have the human connection. And so if this had worked, it <laughs> would have been brilliant. And, and I mean, some of that is not the author's fault because as I said, she's trying to keep a lot of people out of political trouble, but at the same time, she could have chosen more of the people who are living overseas because there are certainly enough of them that maybe she could have shifted the focus a little bit on that. The other issue that I had with this is that one of the connecting stories that drives forward in time is that for a number of years, her family was trying to kick out tenants that they had in an apartment that her grandmother owned. And Syrian law at the time said that you can't evict a tenant if they're paying, the tenant was paying. And her family had other homes. They weren't, nobody was homeless. This was gonna be a vacation home for her family who live in the US. And I just thought this is a horrible linking story because it just makes you seem like these rich landlords who are kicking people out, whose house then gets bombed when they finally do kick them out. And the, the man in this couple that was living in the house does sound like a terrible person, but his wife didn't sound like a terrible person. And frankly, being a bad person doesn't mean you deserve to be evicted. 
So I don't know, it was weird that she clearly thought that this was a really sympathetic story about her family that she was telling us. And I just thought, you don't come off. Like, this is not a sympathetic story. I don't know. Um, so that was a little frustrating because again, I think having this context of history, because I think a lot of books that deal with what has been happening in Syria recently, look at the tail end of, uh, of Assad's regime and nothing else. And I think if you can't lead that into like the French period and the Ottoman period before that, you don't really have the full picture. And like, I love that she was trying to give the full picture, but the eviction story is terrible and it just didn't quite work for me, but I love what I was trying to do. And finally, I read another a graphic novel that, that is loosely fictionalized history, and that was Paco Roca's Twists of Fate. This is interesting because the author appears as a character in the story, and he is interviewing a 90-something Spanish man living in France who turns out to be one of the exiles from the Spanish Civil War who fought in the Second World War. And the character that's being quote unquote interviewed is actually an amalgam of different characters. And in reality, most of these men were dead. So when the author was researching this, he was mostly looking at diaries and books and memoirs and things like that. So it's kind of a, a funny thing to have this artificial framework through which we get the story, but it does work. It, it is pretty compelling and it does draw attention to a piece of history that I think a lot of people forget about because, you know, the French like to pretend that nobody else was involved in, in their stuff. But also just because I think it's generally known that a lot of the Spanish Civil War exiles went to France, Morocco, uh, Algeria, to Latin America, but what happened in between to the ones that weren't in Latin America was interesting, like how many of them were were drafted or imprisoned once France was invaded and the, the government was the puppet government. And, and so that's all really interesting. And it's also interesting how once they got into the pre-French army after a lot of the prison camps and work camps and things had happened, how these Spanish guys had essentially gone in assuming they were liberating Europe from fascism and not so much that they were liberating France from the Germans because they went in with an assumption that next we march to Madrid. And, and obviously reading this, you know that the character in the book is in France and you know that the history, like Franco was in power until the 1970s. So obviously they don't kick the fascists out of Spain, which I think in some ways makes it sadder because you know that this, again, amalgam character, so he's not really a person, but who's based on real people, who's reflecting back on the kind of naivete of having volunteered for something that was the right thing, but you know you were not getting in the reciprocal support that you were expecting and all of that. So yeah, I thought this was fantastic. And you do get peeks at, at what was happening with, with the, uh, the North African troops and the Chadian troops who were dismissed and who had been fighting in North Africa, but then weren't allowed to go into Europe. And it's just good stuff. It has a lot of good history and it tells it, like with the, with the Machno, book that I talked about earlier. Reading that, I, I didn't have a sense of why does this need to be fictionalized? Why wouldn't you just write a biography? Whereas this has, it makes sense that you have this uh, extra step in there. And I thought it worked to convey the history through fiction in a way that I think a lot of these books, you do think just write a biography, but this made sense in a way that, uh, and was successful in a way that doesn't always work. Yeah, so that's been my recent reading so far in January. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. And yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.